All right. Well, good morning, Morgan. Good morning. We're doing our Bullets and Breakfast Coffee Podcast. So, I don't know if you saw or not. There's a lot of celebrity news right now. Um, I don't know, like, how to address the Puff Daddy situation. Have you... What, what do you What do you know about all that? Nothing. I saw a headline. I, I've seen a few headlines, and honest to God... I haven't paid. I don't even know what's going on. I'll just say I don't even know what's going on. Yeah. There's a, <clears throat> a story that I saw on Fox yesterday that said that um, apparently he had cameras in every room of his house. Okay. That part of, like, the the raid, it has to do with sex trafficking. I know he was raided, and I also know he just unloaded a company. All of them. He's not attached to any company anymore. But they were saying that, like, there's cameras. So, you know, being a security guard-centered channel, I want to try and tie in the CCTV aspect of that situation. But that aside, which that's kind of a salacious thing, I want to kind of get my ducks in a row before I talk about that. But there's another story that's trending right now, and it's about Anthony Mackie. Do you know who Anthony Mackie is? Yeah, the Falcon or whatever. He plays the Falcon. Uh. Plays... Papa Dot are in you, Eight yeah. Mile. Are you about to? No, 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 no. Hang on. Okay. I know it's like we're in a in a day and age where it's like any celebrity that comes up, like they're Not tied any, to but some sort of. Some you're just like, oh no, I don't want anything negative. But go on. Okay, so there's nothing that has to do with anything super nefarious. Okay. So this lady or this chick, she puts up a video, I guess, like on Twitter or whatever, and she says that she's down in New Orleans. And she's at a gas station. This guy rolls up in this, like, real decked out truck, smoked out, you know what I mean? Like a real yeah. sick truck. And she looks over, and Anthony Mackie gets out of the truck and starts pumping his gas. Okay. So she's, this is her words. She's like, you know, I'm real respectful. I walk over, and I'm like, excuse me, Mr. Mackey. And he literally, apparently, according to her, allegedly, like, takes his hand, and he's like, he's like, stop. Doesn't say stop, but just kind of, like, does the, right. the stop thing. And he goes, No. And she said she was kind of like, what? And he was like, no. And then turns back around and starts pumping his gas, mm-hmm. right? So she puts out this video, and she's like, he's the most rude person ever. Like, you know, how are you going to be in the neighborhood and then act like this, blah, blah, blah. Like, do you... So most people on Twitter are saying, like, hey, like, celebrities are not obligated, you know, mm-hmm. to have this interaction with you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you and I were talking about the situation with Michael Keaton the other day where I was saying, like, we have this view of celebrities and how they view, like, their movies or right. their their relationship to us based right. on how we feel about them. Right. Right? Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Like, is he out of line? Does a celebrity need to engage with their fans if they're out in the, in the public? No, absolutely not. Like... We've talked about this where I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what I'd do if I'd see someone. And more of like, I'd probably just kind of stare creepily and inside be fangirling if it was someone who I liked, right? Or maybe even a little externally, but absolutely not. And in a general consensus, I know the fact that they're a celebrity, you sign, you're signing up for the popularity that comes with that, whether it's good or bad popularity, but you're signing up for that recognition, recognition, um, recognition, recognition. Thank you. Um, and things like that. Me taking my own personal stance with this, I do not, in general, and I'm not a famous person, want someone walking up to me and getting into my space. So we don't know, short of CCTV footage from the gas station, if she's 20 feet away and he's like, no, he's still well within his rights to do that. Well, right? we literally talk all the time about the importance of not letting Her, people yes, close the that distance. Space. That gap. So if she rounds the bed of his truck. Just as a person, and people forget the human aspect, but as a person, he has no obligation to let someone in his personal space. If she rounds the front or the tailgate of his truck, and she's like, oh, hi, and I know he's a celebrity, but she, it's selfish to think if you, as one person, see one celebrity at a gas station and no one is there, right? It's selfish. It would be selfish of me to think that I am the only person who has seen him that day and tried to talk to him. Yeah. Him being the popular celebrity. So him saying no, like, no, isn't rude, doesn't make him an asshole, that she wouldn't want, if he wasn't Anthony Mackie, and we, I won't even bring up the whole dynamic of where you know I would go, if he wasn't known as Anthony 
Tiffany Mackey, and she right. was pumping her gas, and he walked up to and her. And she would be within her right. She would, she would yes. be within her right to be said, like, yeah. whoa, like, whole different fucking ball game right now. That's a good point. So, you know, we, we, on this channel specifically, like, I talk all the time about the importance of people not allowing people to get too close to them, not to close that gap. And then for celebrities, like, it's not like celebrities haven't gotten shot in the last 30 years by fans. Whether, you know, Selena gets shot, Tupac, Biggie, like, right. John Lennon, you know what I mean? Like, th these people aren't in a situation where um, where they have to do that. Where they're obligated yeah. to accept anyone at any time walking up to them wanting who knows what. Which brings me to my story about Nick Cannon. I... This that happened eleven years ago. The story that I'm going to share with you guys today about Nick Cannon happened eleven years ago, right? Um, and I never thought about it from the perspective that we're talking now. Like we're talking now, and we're giving Anthony Mackey a little bit of grace in the fact that he is not obligated to let people get close to him. He's not obligated to have a conversation. She could be trying to set this dude up. She could be talking 100%. to him and somebody coming around from the back. So, like looking at it from a safety standpoint, like I look at it a little bit differently, right? Yeah what I'm about to tell you. So in 2013, for those who don't know, I used to be a DJ. I used to be a DJ at a nightclub outside of Penn State University. And um, like, that was my life. Like I was just as, I was gonna say balls deep, but that's gonna lead to a different conversation. But I was just as- It's accurate. <laughs> just as motivated and, and involved. Let's just say that. Just as motivated and involved in the DJ nightclub scene as I am in security. So, um, Every year they would have like a DJ convention in Atlantic City. So in 2013, I went to this DJ convention and um, stayed at a really nice hotel. Might have even been Trump Plaza. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, you would have the, the trade show during the day. They would have like little classes or things that you can do. And then at night there would be like a concert or some sort of demonstration. You know, people will party. So... Uh, me and this other guy that were hanging out there, we went to, it might've been like Caesar's Palace or, or some shit like that. And we go to this nightclub, um, a after the, the day's events or whatever. So I'll just get to the point. Long story short, in the VIP section sits Nick Cannon. Okay. And the way they have it set up is like, in order for you to get from the dance floor to the bar, you literally have to walk through this VIP section. If you've ever watched the show um, Bar Rescue, right? The guy, John Taffer, that's on Bar Rescue is always screaming at people. He calls it a butt funnel. And a butt funnel is where the people that are on the dance floor have to go through a tight squeeze to get to the bar. And that puts people in close proximity. And that's how people spring up conversation, right? That was just a little tidbit of extra information, okay. if anybody cares. Now that, I have, now that I have my degree, you know, I have all these smart oh, shit. things in my mind, right? So anyway, I walk past the VIP section and I see Nick Cannon. Nick Cannon is sitting in a, a VIP little booth thing. And he's completely by himself. He's on his phone. And I'm like, oh, shit, that's Nick Cannon. And I go, hey, Nick. And I take one step towards the VIP. And this dude who's like twice my size and my size and a half in height, he just like little kids me and puts his hand on my chest. And he's like, stop. He's like, oh. Mr. Cannon ain't talking to people today. I'm like, first off, get your hand off of me. And he like grabs my shirt tighter. And I was like, or if you would prefer, you can keep a hold of my shirt, your choice, right? <laughs> and uh, so while the guy's like gaffling me up from behind me, I hear a voice that immediately I recognize. And he goes, "I right, man, let him go. Punk ass bitch. And I'm like, that cannot be what I think it is. And I turn around, and sure enough, the neon icon riffraff is sitting directly on the other side. There's a second VIP booth. Right. Riffraff is over there with, like, there's a squirrel on our, um, on the hammock, on the hammock I thought. He might Maybe. be hanging out. Anyway. Um, no, Riffraff is directly across. He's behind me. He's got, like, women and, like, fucking alcohol. Riff Raff, his, his joint is popping. And the bodyguard, like, looks over at Riff Raff and he goes, hey, man, come over here with us. And I'm like, what? So I walk over 
And the 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 bodyguard that's over at Riff Raff, Riff Raff had like a one of those little like velvet rope type things. Yeah. The guy lifts the velvet rope and I walk in. The odd thing is that when I walk in, Riff Raff doesn't say anything else. Like he literally goes back to talking to these three or four women that are around him. There's beautiful women everywhere. They're just like sitting down on their phones. Like no one is really associating it was weird it was just like everybody was just kind of like furniture they're just all just kind of there right and then Riff Raff was doing his own thing so now I'm standing in this VIP section I don't know anybody I'm like this just random dude I'm just kind of like now no disrespect to my wife that's here right but you put me in that situation now <laughs> you put your boy in that situation now to be fair you were a little green behind the ears I was a little family. green behind the ears you put your boy in that situation now yo Hey. You know how to play the game. Yeah, no. Your boy would have been set. So anyway, I sit down next to this, like, random blonde who, you know, didn't even know that I existed. And I'm just kind of sitting there twiddling my thumbs. And um, so the bodyguard comes over. He's like, yo, man, you want some uh, some drinks, some champagne, man? Help yourself out, you know, whatever. So I, like, drink a little bit of fucking alcohol or whatever. And I just sit there. For, like, 45 minutes, I literally just sit there just kind of like... And then... Riff Raff gets up and he's like, all right. He's like, hey, let's go. And he looks over at me and he goes, hey, man, we're about to hit the strip. You want to go with us? And your dumb ass said no. You're, man, I'm, I was going to dramatically get to that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Forget you heard that. So Riff Raff gets up. All right, everybody, let's go. That's how Riff Raff talks if you've never heard him talk. And so everybody gets up and they start grabbing their stuff. And he looks at me and he goes, hey, man, we're about to hit the strip. You want to go with us? And in that moment, for whatever reason, I don't. Come on, days of our lives. Yeah. I said, no, nah, man, I'm good. I don't know why I said that. No, nah, man, I'm good. No, nah, man, I'm good. Twelve beautiful women. I'm assuming a Lamborghini or some shit. A rap star. I could be doing security right now or like the lead blunt roller guy. Like there's a lot. I could be like a hype man. Who knows? You fucked up. Who knows what could have happened? Why do you think that I, why do you, uh, you know me. Why do you think that I hesitated in that moment? How old were you? I don't know. 20, uh, no, 30. You, you had been early. 30s. Well, 10 years ago. So 36, 35, 34, 35-ish. Let's play 34. I was running the street. Can I, okay, I only have to say this based on clearly the things you've told me, right? Okay, and go ahead. Lay it on me. Because you were cock of the block in the circles you run in, but... Big fish, small pond. Big fish, small pond, but now... Now you're a fish thrown, you're a little fish thrown into the big old ocean. Into the ocean. So for me, that's the analogy I use, just knowing what I know about you and all the stories and things I've heard. Like, if I had to peg it, you said that probably just for the fact that it's just like, kind of like a holy fucking shit. But you couldn't hang, bro. And I, not even probably you couldn't hang, but there was probably a trepidation. Maybe not, but is, there probably would be a trepidation there. Uh, because you don't, all of the assumptions and stereotypes about what you think could happen that night, right, run through your head. Like the hangover. Con yeah, you literally took the words out of my mouth. Like, you know, you don't ever go thinking that that's how the night's going to go. But now that we've all seen that movie, if four, if four <laughs> dudes go to Vegas, you're kind of like thinking that, going, yeah, let's not do that, okay? But you just don't know, so. I think that, you know what, that brings up a great point. You know, we all in look, I can I can totally tie this into security. A lot of times we have this idea of the types of situations that we can I don't want to say be successful in, but that we could handle. Right? Guys all the time are like, Oh, you know, there's an active shooter, I can handle the active shooter. Oh yeah, yeah. I train, right? Oh, if there's a hands on situation and I gotta get into it with somebody, I can defend myself. Like the way that things play out in your mind and your ability to handle them 
in totally reality different. are totally different. Uh, my, my shooting instructor, Marcus, said something the other day that I thought was so applicable. He goes, can you swim? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, no, 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 no. Can you swim? He goes, there's being able to swim and then there's being able to swim. So if I put you, you know, you're six foot two. If I put you in a 10 foot pool and I put you in the middle of the pool, can you swim from the middle of the pool to the edge? Yeah. Okay. If I put you in a 20 foot pool and I put you 25 yards down at the end, can you swim from there all the way to the other without having problems? I'm like, maybe. Might be bigger than a 20 foot pool, but I get where you're going. I'm saying 20 foot deep. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Okay. He goes, can you swim in the ocean? Can you swim in the ocean with your shoes on? Can you swim in the ocean with your shoes on and all of your gear? Like Navy SEALs, they swim in the ocean with gear, with guns, that's being able to swim, right? So, yeah, you can party. You can pick up women. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's one. Yeah. You, you can party. You can pick up women. You can run the streets. You can shut down the bar in rural Pennsylvania, motherfucker. Can right, you right, do right. that in Atlantic City <laughs> with riffraff? Like, are you ready right. for that? Right. That's now, exactly right. Me at my age, I would try. I would definitely try. If I lose, I lose. You could do it today. I could do it today. But you have you have so much under your belt. And, life, yeah. You know. In, in life, in order for you to take on heavy challenges, you either have to be at a level of sure confidence where you've had enough experiences to, to know that you can handle them or be insane or be young enough or naive enough to not know what you don't know. Right. Yeah. Sometimes you can surprise yourself. I surprised my. You asked me two months ago about a dog attack to my face, knowing how. I'm just saying, knowing how I feel about it. I handled the mood that. Down. No, but I feel like I handled that. If someone would have asked me two months ago, I would have been totally what I think you expect to be, which is not handling. It'd be like the worst thing ever, and it was terrible. But in the moment of. Bullshit, I think I handled it really well and you, you know handled it extremely executed well, yes. the things yes. well and I never would have thought I could do that. So I think sometimes you maybe would have surprised yourself ten years ago or eleven I think years ago. As 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 corny as it sounds, because like that was a you know, an anomaly of a situation. Bullshit. You have so many anomalies. I have a lot of situations. Like, I, for whatever reason, run across celebrities in yeah. weird situations. But I do think that, like, that's one of the top five regrets that I wish I would have seen how that night would have played out. You know? Yeah. It was just, it was weird and random. It would have been balls deep and five different women. Oh, my gosh. I cannot believe you. Just pointing out the obvious. You're horrible. Have you read any good uh, am, am I the Asshole lately? No. No. Okay. Well, that was my Nick Cannon story. Let me see what the comments say. Somebody says, bro, you look just like me. I'm going to go to this guy's page and see what he looks like. Hopefully he's not ugly. Jake Spade Production says, hey, y'all. He says, celebrities or something won't do protection for, honestly. Uh, somebody says, I just subscribed. Mike, thanks for the subscription. I appreciate it, man. Uh, somebody says, I'm about to lie on Nick. No, there's no lie. I, I didn't have any, listen, there's nothing to lie about with Nick Cannon. There was no interaction. He never looked up. It was only his bodyguard and he was adamant that I was not getting him. Uh, Frank Martin says, I have to provide security for celebrities. Some are clueless about their own safety. They think everyone loves them. Oh, hey, there's a good um, there's a good uh, picture on Coleon Noir's page where I think it's I don't know if it's if it's the baby. It's some rapper. I'm, I don't know all these new rappers, man. I'm getting old. Everybody's a little or a baby or something. But one of the main rappers is taking pictures with his fans. And you can clearly see that in his hoodie pocket, he has his hand on a firearm and the firearm is pointed towards. The fans. the fans. So the fans coming up and putting their arm around him and hugging him. And he's like, hey, what's up? But he's got his gun, his hand on his gun. Um, and there's a lot of conversation about whether or not, like, that's safe, mm -hmm. whether or not it's proper. But it goes back to the Anthony Mackie situation of, you know, these guys, they're targets, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Do you think country singers feel that way? Like, is that just a rapper thing? Is that a, is that a, you hear about celebrities, whether they're black celebrities or like, you know, Tom Cruise is, is uh, well known for freaking out on people to try and talk to him. Johnny Depp apparently like is maybe one of the more sociable people. Mm -hmm. Um, But like, do you think that country artists feel that way? I don't, I don't ever hear stories about country singers like being rude to people. Yeah, no, I get, I don't either. Um, I don't either. I don't ever hear. I mean, what was the Morgan Wallen? I mean, you know, Morgan Wallen calls somebody the N word, but you know, let me tell you, that is how. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So, but I don't know the story. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, but I don't yeah. know the story about that, so I don't know if it was a fan situation hey, or. Let me just say this with all honesty and transparency, okay? That's how good Morgan Wallen's music is to me. I, I, I'm i sorry, man. I, I fucks with Morgan Wallen. I don't know. I, I'm sorry. Like, I don't know what the situation was. And if I ever met him, you know, we just had to let that shit slide. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. You never hear it, but you know, I see, I don't know. I almost never hear positive stories, though. Let me just say that about country music. You really don't hear about people running into country singers. Right. I do want to... I want to talk about, like, some of the... It's it's crazy that all this ties together. Speaking of Riff Raff. So Riff Raff has been accused by a lot of people, mostly in the black community. People accuse Riff Raff of culturally appropriating the worst aspects of black culture so you know who flavor Flav is right oh yeah all right so riff raff basically kind of carries himself and dressed he doesn't necessarily do that now but like back in the day he kind of carried himself like flavor Flav. Okay. you saw the movie spring breakers with james franco no and selena gomez the character that James Franco plays in that movie, they say he, he modeled it directly after Riff Raff. I think Riff Raff won a lawsuit after that. But anyway, the point is that Riff Raff kind of got famous by being very stereotypical, you know, black. Yeah, that's him. Right? Here, let me see it. For anybody who doesn't know who Riff Raff is, that's, that's Riff Raff. Ice grill and all that shit, right? He's a white dude, yeah. She's my... <laughs> Morgan was like, is he what? I'm like, because he looks white. Is that what this whole conversation is about? Are you not paying attention to what we're talking about here? I don't know who Rick is. Go to my, uh, here, I'm going to pull up my channel. I'm going to show y'all a picture from that night. If y'all haven't been on my channel and seen it. Iceberg Simpson is what he calls himself. This is the most random conversation. This is a picture of me and Riff Raff that night. If you can see it. That's the neon icon and your boy. Big D. Let me see. Right there. So my question is, a lot of the a lot of the what are you smiling about? A lot of the country artists, do you do you have a problem with them co opting blue collar? dress and 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 nature because like you know your family is from missouri your family is from the farms like you have farm family right right i was there's a rapper named adam calhoun there's a a country rapper named adam calhoun and he carries himself you know very country boyish right Mm -hmm. and i did a video reaction and somebody commented they were like dude he's from chicago like he's not even he's not a country boy so like that has been real popular to like co-opt the swag of like you know carhartt and like people that work and all that shit like do you have a problem with that as somebody who's from that area no you don't care well for like the if most, somebody's not country if, like uh, no absolutely not because then at that point i may as well get on to drake and we just had this talk the other day for being in fucking degrassi from some teeny bopper show and raised with a ton of money and wealthy and now why everybody always out. throwing drake under the bus we are not talking about drake right now i know but um so you're talking about like co-opting stuff he didn't grow up in the hood and blah 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 whatever he first about. off there will be no drake slander <laughs> in this house number one but no stay I on know. topic Listen, if they're talking about, I know, how they dress, 
and things like that. Absolutely not. And I haven't heard who the guy you're talking about from Chicago. I haven't heard his music. I'm going to assume unless it's a song that's just played and I just didn't know his name. But I think it only matters like I don't think it matters. No, I would not look at someone and if they're talking about whatever they're singing or talking about in their music, you know, and be like, oh, you don't know that because just because you just, you can't. He might be from Chicago, but maybe he spent the summers with his grandparents somewhere else working the farm. That does, why you do know we care? Saying? Like, no, that's exactly right. Steven Seagal is not really a cop. Like, why do we, we don't watch, oh, you know, above the law and be like, oh, he's not really a cop. Like, why do people get so butthurt about how people dress, what they wear? You know, this is a, a industry topic in security. People have like a fucking bug up their ass about how security guards dress. Right. If you're wearing a tactical carrier, if you're wearing, you know, you're wearing too much equipment, you're carrying too much stuff. Like, why do you think people have such a bug up their ass about how people decide to dress, carry themselves, and present themselves? Without bringing Drake into it. I just think they have, I don't know, nothing better to do with their time in general. But, I don't know. I just want to... Riveting know. conversation from my wife over here today. Know. Hold on, but who just questions that? Who question the people, Morgan? I'm, the the people—it's rhetorical, honey. Like again, I don't give a shit about your boy and where and what and how he's raised. If he puts out good music, he puts out good music, right? I don't give a shit if some dude from Chicago is has no roots whatsoever in farming or country life or simplistic or redneck or whatever anybody like kind of wants to call it. I don't care. And so it's rhetorical when I say who cares about that stuff. Oh, okay. Like it doesn't matter across the board to me what someone does or doesn't say. Like when it comes to their music. Yeah. Well, I'm we're gonna later on today I wanna show you this guy named Jam Wayne. Okay. So now that we've laid that that foundation, we've put those roots down. There's a guy named Jam Wayne who's my age or older. A lot of, it's crazy, like, you can't find any information on this guy. It's almost like they have scrubbed everything, right? Mm -hmm. So he seems to be, like, you know, 46 or older. He's got that zaddy look. White dude with the salt and pepper beard, you know, brushed out. Zaddy or daddy? You probably have to say In zaddy. the black community, it's a zaddy. It's a zaddy. You know, okay. it's a white dude. Yeah. You know, that's a whole different conversation. But, yeah. but anyway, so he's got a country... Feel or a country persona. persona, okay, but at the same time, a lot of hip hop influence. But done from so he's not riffraff, he's not doing the right, the you know what I mean, the yeah. blinged out like ghetto look. Mm -hmm. He's staying true to you know, more of a blue collar look. So mm -hmm. it's like if your uncle who works on the damn railroad started rapping. So I'm interested to get your opinion on that. And it, you can't tell people uh, music. We're getting off topic here. No, You're, we're not. Every topic like, is tough. Okay, music is such a personal thing for people. We talk about that uh, our own selves, right? Hearing a song or certain things, we were like, "Holy shit!" Right? Takes you down memory lane, and you can go back to how you felt when the first time you heard that song, or going through a period in your life. And the music you listen to and all that, you know, we talk about that. And so it's different for every person. And you can't s say what someone is interested in. And, and I am in no way musically inclined. So for me, I can't even begin to describe what an artist or someone who loves music from the making side of it, what they like or don't like, right? And you can't tell people because you look a certain way. That is across the board in so many times because you look a certain way. I may not like the songs Beyonce has come out for country, but I hope she fucking succeeds if that's what she wants to do and if she can put out some real bangers, right? And there should be no one saying, oh, well, you've done pop or you've done this for the last 20 years. You, you better gatekeep. stay in that lane. Yeah. yeah. Gatekeeping. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, um, I grew up, in, in, in Arkansas, and I grew up like first generation middle class because my parents grew up in segregated neighborhoods, right? 
So when my dad bought his first house, it was in a, in a white neighborhood. He was the first generation that was allowed to do that. I don't think people understand that kind of stuff, right? They don't. So the kids on my street, you know, we had like 12 families from the end of the street all the way down to the other end of the street. There's 12 families that lived there. All the kids on my street were white. Mm -hmm. And probably five of those kids were like between five and eight years older than me. So I'll never forget, we had um, these two brothers, right? And it was Dusty and Randy. And they literally could have been the prototype for Beavis and Butthead. One was a brunette, one was a blonde. They wore Metallica t-shirts. They, I'm, I think they might have been like inbred to a degree because they were like half, you know what I mean? I, okay. I'm but, not saying this yeah, to be rude. No. I lived in Arkansas. It is I what it is, okay? I but they were really into heavy metal. So, like, they had the IROC Z that was parked on the side of the street that was up on blocks. They were always working on the car. They were just that kind of kind of guys, right? Right. So, they would always blast Metallica. And so, I'll never forget, like, I'm playing basketball in, in the street. I'm four houses down from them. And they're playing Metallica 1. Doom, 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 yeah. doom. Doom, 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 doom. And I'm playing basketball and I'm listening to this song and like I'm getting goosebumps right now. Like that song just hit. And I'm listening to this song and I'm just like, fuck. I you know, I'm 10. I'm that I didn't say fuck, but yeah. it just hit me. You know how like a song hits you? That song hit me. And I remember like my basketball rolling down the street so I could walk down there. And I, and you know, my parents were like, stay away from Dusty and Randy. They're devil worshipers. <laughs> they're devil worshipers and they're going to try and eat you or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. And not, you know, they might have, who knows? But anyway, I go down there and they're working on the car. They're playing Metallica. And I asked them, I said, what song is that? And he goes, oh, that's Metallica. That's Metallica one. And so we started talking about Metallica, right? I go home and it just so happened within like, you know, a short period of time after that, I'm watching MTV and the video comes on. And I tell my dad, I'm like, I want that record for Christmas. And my dad was like, what? And I'm like, I want that record for Christmas. He's like, why? I'm like, I like that song. And he's like, we don't like that song. I'm like, what do you mean we, like, what yeah. do you mean we don't like that song? And he goes, that's white folks music. We don't listen to that. We don't listen to that. And that put like this weird feeling mm -hmm. about music that had never been there before. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to like my, the summer of my eighth grade year going into ninth grade, you know, I'm hanging out with my friends and we go over to Bo Freeman's house. I'll never forget. We go over to Bo Freeman's house. His dad had just bought a Corvette. And so, you know, Bo's showing us the Corvette and he's like, you got to listen to the, to the sound system. And he gets in and he cranks it up and it's smashing pumpkins today. And the same reaction that I had to Metallica, I had to that song. And I'm just like sitting there. I had never heard anything. It could have been the fact that it was a brand new sound system or whatever, but I had never heard that song before. And I had never heard something sound like that since the Metallica song, right? And I'm like, who is that? Smash Pumpkins. And so like I had this moment of this weird feeling of like not wanting to lean into that type of music on the low I started listening to Smash and Pumpkins. I started listening to Nirvana. I started listening to Alice in Chains. Like, mm -hmm. I'm listening to all of the grunge music, but I'm doing it in my headphones where my parents can't hear it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I'll never forget, like, there was this girl. She sat in front of me in one of my classes, and she had a, a Nirvana shirt on. Um, and it said Sliver. It's one of their songs, right? And I knew, and I wanted to, like, talk to her about the fact that I knew. Mm -hmm. This is before the internet, guys. Like, you... You know, back before the internet, if you were into something, you had to seek it out. And, like, everybody just didn't pick up on references and shit. Like, so I'll never forget that, like, just knowing that I that I knew that song. I wanted to connect with this chick. She was an outcast in my school because she was one of the grunge kids. And, mm -hmm. like, that wasn't something that everybody was into in Arkansas, mm -hmm. you know. And then, you know, she reached out to me on Facebook years later after graduation, you know, fucking 10 years later. And we talked about that. I was like, you know, music was such an important part of my life. And, you know, I, I had a hard time coming to terms with who I was, what I liked, what I was into, because, like, I had all these barriers placed on me, mm -hmm. you know. And I remember you sitting in front of me and you wearing that Nirvana shirt. And I wanted to talk to you about that Nirvana album. And, you know, she laughed. And, mm -hmm. 
Hmm? I think she ended up killing herself a couple years later. Oh, fuck. Yeah. That's terrible. Okay. Yeah. But, no. I don't know where I'm going with that. It's just a... <laughs> Dude, you get old. You have like you have like random morbid stories. Like you, did you ever talk to your parents? Like have your parents just like tell you stories about stuff like when they were younger and stuff? And like you would just hear things. You'd be like, "Why have you never told me that?" And they'd be like, "Oh, it just never came up." You'd be like, "You?" No, but no, it wasn't a why didn't you ever tell me? But yes, I ask my parents stuff all the time. My parents are big storytellers, so. But never a, why didn't you tell me that? Like, it ain't my business to, to know till it's my business to know. So I've never thought about asking him, why have you never told me that? Hmm. Oh, well, anyway. Were you, um, you don't remember where you were going with this? No, just, I don't know. I mean, the we were talking about, like, cul you know, cultural like, appropriation and, like, how... I, you know, I, I told okay, my... I got a question. Well, let me just say this real quick. I did. I told my kids, you know, like, like what you like, be who you want to be, love who you love. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to just, like, be open and honest that I like white women. Mm -hmm. You know, people in my family would be like, you only date white girls. I'd be like, I don't... I would get so defensive. I don't only date white girls. I dated Keisha in eighth grade. And you know what I mean? Like, it would be like this big argument. Or, like, you know, a black woman would see me with you, or not with you, but with yeah. any white girl, and they'd, like, roll their eyes and suck their teeth, and, you know, I'd feel this need to, like, apologize or advocate for who I was with, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It took me a long time, and it, I was in my, fuck, late 30s before I just got to the point where I'm like, I like what I like, I don't need to defend it to anybody, I don't need to explain it to anybody, like, who gives a fuck? Mm -hmm. I, the same thing with the dress. When you and I first got together, it, it, you know, you and I met in 2016, it was probably 2012, 2013 before I really started allowing myself just to dress the way that I want to dress. Like mm -hmm. people give me a hard time. Oh, you wear flannel shirts all the time and you dress like you're a fucking hick and da, 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 da. It's like, you know what? That's what I like to wear. You know? I, yeah. I liked how you dressed when we met. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say, like, my favorite on... What? Here. Oh, that mesh crop top you had. Oh. oh. <laughs> but I like your flannel and your t-shirts and your... I cutlass. can't I pull like off the mesh crop top I when know, I'm, I'm 80 pounds heavier than when you first met me. I'm just saying I like all the witch ways. Like, I, it was a little uh, different at first, I'll say, but we had a big conversation about the whys. It was when we actually visited Portland before we moved to Portland and you went to that farm store. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, like, you know, but no. I, now, is it is it cultural? See, I feel like that's such a, I know that's such a PC word. Is it cultural? Here's my question. Is it cultural appropriation, though, like what we're talking about with the dude from Chicago, basically in reverse with white people? You know, we hear that and we see that a lot where people mimic what they think is or the stereotypes of the black community, right? That's where it's the most, I'll say, popularly used. Um, but is it still, would it be deemed, is it appropriate to use the term cultural appropriation with, in reverse with If white it's people? white guys taking on country persona, I think it is. Like if I was a blue collar worker, if I, you know, if I was somebody in your, I, I don't know, like maybe, I don't know. I think it's weird if you're doing it in a in a negative way. You know what I mean? Like I, I think it would be bad if like somebody was dressing like a like a lineman, uh, a blue collar lineman, and then having some sort of negative connotation to it. I guess that would be the only thing that I could see something being wrong with it. But country people, people in the country music space, seem to like it regardless. Like they don't seem to question it. I don't ever see anybody that's a country fan question somebody's authenticity. I maybe a little bit with Morgan Wallen. You know what? The only time I've ever heard it, I will tell you the only time I've ever heard it in that regard is when the artist is specifically targeting women. Like people have a problem with Sam Smith, Florida, Georgia line, 
and a little bit of Morgan Wallen. But men have the problem, and you it's, yeah, took it's men. the thoughts Go out ahead. of my head just now because that's – I don't want to say women, but I, I am. Women run country music from the fan base. Yeah, that's where the money comes from. So for, for me – I, like from Luke Combs, who's a big dude, right? Like not necessarily the most attractive, but like he can sing the things he sings about. Panty drop, right? Like I'm saying, and as a woman listening to country music, and the same with Sam Smith, it makes you go or um, uh, Sam Hunt. Sorry, Sam, oh, I thought Sam, you said Sam Smith. You said I mean Sam, Sam Hunt. Yeah, Sam Hunt. Sam Hunt uh, is totally different type of genre, you know, in his way. And same with Brantley Gilbert is more of the rock country. You know, um, and has kind of that rock look to him. But, like, women run country music. And so I feel like you really only get the men, and maybe rightly so, but who go, you don't know nothing about work in these fields, right? You don't know nothing about this to Sam Hunt, who maybe doesn't know about working the fields and this and that. But, again, it's one of those things, like, women run. That, that's probably the, the only time I ever hear music. something negative is, like, guys... Right. That have a problem with like the guys who are really popular with women, right? But that's you know, when I was in, <laughs> I'm gonna date myself here. We had like a when I was in sixth grade, we started a anti new kids on the block club. Do not tell Krista. That. I'm gonna tell her, Krista. We started the anti new kids on the block club because all the girls were like, they were yes. crazy. How old were you? How old's Krista? I was like, oh a, yeah, I was like eleven at the time. Yeah, that's like correct. everybody was crazy. <laughs> About like you could not try and talk to a girl at school without them bringing up new kids on the block. So all the guys, we all got together and we were like, we hate new kids on the block. I had never heard one new kids on the block, but I was I was going hard for my for my crew. Yeah. And we didn't fucks with new kids. I don't fucks with new kids. They're smidge. we're gonna tell we're gonna tell Chris. They're a smidge before my time. Yeah. Just a smidge. Yeah. All right. Well, this was a good chat. Huh. Anybody got a question for me before I get off of here? Um, all your fans are like, we love new kids. I know, right? No. <laughs> uh, in the country. Okay. Hey, that's a dope t-shirt slant. That's a dope t-shirt. Uh, he said, in the country, dot, 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 there is no appropriation. I like that. Yeah. That's a bar. That's a good t-shirt right there. Yeah. With a black dude with a Confederate flag on. My granny would wear that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, well, this will be the last thing. Morgan's grandma, very proud country woman, okay? And very high up in the United Daughters of the Confederacy. She runs the chapter. So for those who don't know, the United Daughters of the Confederacy is a, um, a southern-based group that started after the Civil War. And their primary job was to take care of and to nurse and care for the Confederate soldiers that were getting older and dying in, say, like the late 1800s, early 1900s. And as the majority of the remaining Confederate soldiers passed away, um, they picked up the mantle of something called the Lost Cause. This is a little bit of history for you guys, right? So the Lost Cause was an effort to preserve the heritage of the Confederate Army. So all of the statues in 2020 that people were advocating to have removed, those were put up, the money was raised, they were erected, they were created by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, right? So Morgan's grandmother, that's her lineage. She is very proud of that lineage. It's something that she is... is uh, a, a big part of and, and she's very prideful in that so when Morgan and I started dating you know clearly that brought up some conversations okay no one's ever brought a black person home before yeah <laughs> so I used to you know you, you guys know me right like we I don't have a problem shying away from these conversations and so I thought that it was like an opportunity for some zingers for some funny shit, you know what I mean? So we were at, you know, Morgan's grandmother and I, we have a, we've had a, we had a decent relationship. We got along, but there was always different political views at the time. This is mm -hmm. this 2016, 2017-ish time. And so I think we went to Christmas or I think it was Thanksgiving or we went something. Went to Thanksgiving and 
then Christmas, and then Easter is when, if you're getting to the conversation that happened, Easter was when it happened to you, it was your third holiday with my family. That's well, at some point in time, you know, we had had like a little contentious conversation and it, it caused like some problems, right? And so we had basically tried to mend the fences and get along. And so I didn't have a problem with her. I think that the misconception is that like I held some sort of grudge or some sort of negative view of her and I didn't. And so we get over to the house and I think it was Thanksgiving and um, we were getting ready to leave. And so I'm giving her a hug goodbye. And I said, hey, I said, um, I wanted to let you know that for Christmas, I was going to get you a Kaepernick jersey. I was like, I'm put your name on the back of it, you know, and she kind of just like sat there and she just kind of shook her head and she goes, well, I've got some stuff for you downstairs, too. Um, she was like, do you want me to go grab that? And I was like, no. And I was like, let's stop this conversation before it goes any further south. And she was like, OK, like didn't miss a beat. You know what I mean? So respect her. But when I started doing Fox News appearances, she she kind of changed her tune. I think she's a big fan of mine now. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody says there's a spider on the wall behind you. Watch out. I don't see any spiders. I wouldn't put it past it in this house, though. All right. I'm eating my breakfast. We've been on here for 45 minutes. Y'all, thanks for listening to us chat. I, look, I like doing these uh, live streams with my wife because part of the security guard community, if you're here and you're from my channel, I try to talk about all aspects of what we do. I talk about the defensive tactics, the training, the firearms. I talk about the soft skills, the importance of the soft skills. One of the most important foundations of you being a good guard and a good officer is having a stable home life because you're going to deal with a lot of bullshit. You're going to deal with a lot of negativity. You're going to deal with a lot of toxicity. You're going to deal with a lot of danger. And you have to have a solid relationship with someone that you can talk to, that you can relate to. And these conversations are conversations that she and I would have, whether this phone is on or not. And we like to record these conversations just to show you guys how we interact and just show you how we, you know, commune with each other because it's important. And it's important for people to know that I'm a well-rounded person. I'm a complete person. You know, um, my, my home life is important to me. My wife's opinion is important to me. Her friendship is important to me. So hopefully by modeling that, some of you guys will see that and and put that into play in your own relationship. I wish they could really hear some good conversations we get in. We never remember to record those, though. Somebody said, wait, what was bad about the stuff in the basement? I don't know, and I don't want to find out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Morgan's like, yeah. Right. I'm pretty sure if i'm remembering that correctly when you said that about a kaepernick i think she told you if i'm remembering right which would have been like five years ago six years ago but i thought she said that she had a confederate t-shirt for you in the basement well, that might be i way. thought that's what she said because she didn't miss a beat and you were like i no <laughs> all yeah. right we're out of here